Welcome to our interview this week for Wisdom from World Religions. And today I'm in the famed lab called the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia, a globally known place because of its origins in the work of Ian Stevenson, a researcher of alleged uh, of past life experiences. And this lab, the Division of Perceptual Studies, has actually grown out of that work. And today uh, we're here to interview Professor Ed Kelly, uh, who is a research professor here at DOP as it's locally known, and in the Department of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. Um, uh, Dr. Kelly Ed's uh, research interests foc on, focus on psychical research and functional neuroimaging. He's also the lead author of four books, including Beyond Physicalism, Toward Reconciliation of Science and Spirituality, uh, Altered States of Consciousness and Psi, or Psychic Phenomena, and third, uh, Irreducible Mind Toward a Psychology for the 21st Century. Professor Kelly, it's great to be here with you today. And I must say that uh, in my own book that came out recently, I quote uh, your book, Beyond Physicalism, and these are, uh, these are uh, uh, important and significant volumes because they really uh, take on questions that we're going to get into in the next couple of minutes about the relationship between science uh, and religion. Uh, but I would just like to, if you wouldn't mind just saying a word or two about DOPS, uh, where we are right now and how uh -huh. it got started, and maybe why you're here, what you do here, yes. Mm, um... Yeah, well, we've uh, been in existence for about 50 years. Uh, the division was founded by Ian Stevenson in uh, 1967. Um, and Ian uh, had been interested in psycho research really throughout his life, uh, but became more interested in the particular topic of uh, small children who begin speaking and acting as though they're remembering events that you can potentially check up on. Uh, so he first wrote a kind of uh, uh, paper about cases he found in the literature, and that led to a small grant that allowed him to go to India oh, and look for some. Oh, yes. And he found, well, he was going to investigate one in particular that he had heard about, uh, but then he found a whole bunch more, and uh, you know that's the the beginning, and it's now led over years, over sort of decades, to on the order of about 2,500 such cases. Yeah, that's a lot. Quite a few of which have been published in excruciating detail. Ian was a real scholar and yes. extremely careful about documentation and so on. Uh, meanwhile, DOPS has also branched out into other areas. Uh, Bruce Grayson has been here for about 40 years working on near-death experiences, mm -hmm. and we'll touch upon those later on sometime. Yes. Um, my wife Emily has done mediumship studies and work on apparitional cases, crisis apparitions, things of that sort. Helped Ian and Bruce in various ways. Uh, what I've brought to DOPS that's relatively new is a neuroimaging facility, mm -hmm. mainly EEG or brainwave research, mm -hmm. but we're interested in other kinds of physiological signals as well. And we're interested in, in correlating those uh, or using those methods to find out about what's going on in the brains of people who are successful at side tasks or able to get into psych-conducive states of consciousness. Well, thanks for that intro. It's really helpful. Um, question that immediately comes to mind is now functional neuroimaging. Mm -hmm. I had an MRI recently, and, uh -huh. uh, and, and I, a lot of people probably are going to immediately ask, what does functional neuroimaging have to do with, with, with psychic research? Well, uh, to give you an idea, uh, or psychical research. Yeah. First got started on this when I was working in the uh, electrical engineering department at Duke mm -hmm. back in the 1970s. Yes. We had a guy who was uh, capable of guessing playing cards at three times chance expectation. Oh. And we had evidence that the way he did it was to close his eyes, wait for little images to go by. Mm -hmm. And if he identified them correctly, you know that, that would be the right answer. So the point is that Something seemed to be happening in his head just before he made a correct response, and we thought we had a chance to find out what that is by looking at EEGs. Uh, and, and and you have uh, uh, there there are there were some experiments done uh, uh, where uh, someone it seemed to indicate that there was uh, a kind of neuro uh, neuroelectrical activity that occurred just before people made a conscious decision. 
and that that therefore was proof that psychic, uh, uh, you know, prevision mm -hmm. wasn't the case. You, you must be familiar with yeah, that. Well, yeah, th that's a very long story. It's yeah. especially the experiments of Benjamin Libet. Yes, Benjamin Libet, which you. which yes. have been used by both sides of the debate. Yes, I personally uh, think it's just a lousy experimental uh, model yes. of voluntary mm -hmm. behavior. So, uh, uh, good. Let, let's not get distracted. Uh, by let's that. not get distracted. <laughs> um, so, you know, the main uh, I, from what from looking at your work, it seems to me that uh, that you're a philosopher and a religious studies scholar as much as a neuroscientist there's no doubt about that your your analysis of the of the mystic mysticism philosophy of mysticism debates between constructivists and others is masterful but I would like to get a sense from you as to why what physicalism is and, and how we got to where we are where it seems to dominate hmm. our lives yeah uh, excellent question and a very correct uh, judgment as to its impact on things uh, Physicalism is really the modern kind of uh, philosophically uh, um, purified version of the materialism of previous centuries. It grew up with the rise of science and particularly physics. Uh, a lot of people regard it as being justified by the triumphs of physics, but that's clearly not the case. From a logical point of view, that's not uh, good evidence for physicalism. Uh, and it comes in a variety of slightly different forms, but the, the basic story of all goes like this, and it's very closely tied to the physics of the late 19th century, mm. just before relativity and quantum mechanics. So the old, the old, before the yeah. new physics, yeah. I mean, and this is the kind of stuff that most people in psychology and neuroscience mm -hmm. have grown up with, grown used to. It's very, so familiar to us, so... Uh, kind of assimilated into our being that it's very hard to challenge it. Anyway, the basic picture is that in the end, all facts are determined by physical facts alone. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a reality out there independent of us. It consists at bottom of some kind of ultimate stuff, little bits of something self-existent, flying around in fields of force mm -hmm. in accordance with mathematical laws. Everything else has to come from that. In particular, we're nothing more than extremely complicated biological machines. Mm -hmm. And everything in mind and consciousness is manufactured by neurophysiological processes and events in our brains. There's a lot of evidence that seems consistent with that picture. But there is also evidence, and we'll talk about that in a moment, mm -hmm. strongly suggesting that that story is not correct. Now, if that story were correct, it's inescapable as a corollary, that there can be no such thing as postmortem survival. Mm -hmm. Because yes. when you die, the machinery that supposedly produces mind and consciousness no longer there. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, uh, so far as we can tell, there are no such things in nature as final causes or any sign of any kind of transcendental aspect to the natural world. And from the physicalist all, perspective. From the physicalist yes. perspective. Mm -hmm. And to all intents and purposes, the universe appears to be totally without meaning or purpose. It's a very That's bleak, bleak picture. Bleak, yes. And but could it be true, even if it's bleak? I get you're coming. It certainly could be true, <laughs> even though bleak. And you know, a number of people, starting with Bertrand Russell, uh, have embraced it. You know, and uh, displayed a kind of heroism uh, yes. going on despite this. Uh, you this, open your book, I think, yeah, with a quotation yeah, from that, right. uh, that. That's a wonderful. I mean, uh, that guy was a terrific. Writer. It was wonderful writing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. Um, uh, where was I going? So, so we were lost. talking about with the bleakness of oh, yeah. it could be true. But, yeah, uh, yes. right. Now, the fact of the matter is that certainly everything, virtually everything going on in mainstream psychology, neuroscience, uh, perhaps even philosophy of mind, is anchored in this kind of classical or crude physicalism. Mm -hmm. um, not only that, but it has kind of seeped into neighboring areas all over the place. Mm -hmm. Our educational system is filled with it from top to bottom. It's become the received wisdom of opinion elites throughout the world, especially here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And to a question that is basically to be uh, attract attention as some kind of a heretic who needs to be punished and driven out of the academy. Yes, What's really shocking extreme. to me yes. is the way that it's invaded even things like the humanities, mm -hmm. even including religious studies. In you know, quote, for sure, I can certainly yeah, attest to that. I saw that in, in your book, and of course we had a bunch of religious scholars, scholars of religion, excuse me, 
I understand. Yeah, that. that's the way to say it. Now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, right. Who who are acutely aware of all this and horrified by it? Right. That's at the SIRSAM, Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. well, and again, can you? Would you mind saying a word or two about the SIRSAM? Yeah. Well, this. Uh, yeah. This this comes up naturally in the context of survival because the way that came about was that uh, Mike Murphy, who uh, you may recognize mm -hmm. as the co-founder of Esalen back in the early '60s, I like guess '62 or somewhere in there. Uh, he's a, I mean, Mike is a polymath, basically, mm -hmm. and a keen student of all this kind of stuff. Uh, recognized very clearly that if physicalism is true, there can't be survival. Is aware that there are people studying survival empirically, mm -hmm. generating evidence suggestive of it. And so he decided to get a bunch of people together and talk about that evidence. Is there evidence? There is evidence of various kinds. Yes. Uh, for example... Um, the cases of the reincarnation type that Ian mm -hmm. has studied. Yes. Uh, we now have over 2,500 of those. Most of them are encoded in a big database so that we can now begin to Is develop, here? Yeah, here, mm -hmm. develop models and test them and that sort of thing. You know, use a whole new dimension to that line of work. Similarly, Bruce Gayson has, uh, Grayson has a collection of uh, about 1,000 MDEs mm -hmm. uh, with lots of uh, questionnaires of various kinds, all uh, assembled in a big SPSS database, so again, we can do the same kind of modeling and analysis mm -hmm. there. Um, and, uh, well, I can tell you a bit about uh, NDEs in particular. I mean, you know, the cases of the reincarnation type, uh, you find persons now who appear to share memories, uh, some personality characteristics, even physical characteristics sometimes, they may have uh, birthmarks or birth defects mm -hmm. corresponding to usually fatal wounds on the body of the previous personality. And these cases appear to give direct evidence of some kind of survival, that a person who lived before is now living again in a different body and you know, changing as he grows into the new life, but uh, remembering stuff from the previous one. Near-death experiences, uh, there's a particular aspect of those that uh, speaks to me as a neuroscientist as well as mm -hmm. a psychologist. And these are the cases that occur under extreme physiological conditions, such as deep general anesthesia mm -hmm. and or cardiac arrest. Uh, about uh, something on the order of 300 or so of Bruce's cases are of that type. And in a certain number of them, a small number so far, uh, there are there is evidence indicating that the experiences actually occur during the period of apparent unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, the, uh, upon revival later on, the person can describe things that took place during that time that can be verified. And sometimes they're not even nearby things. They may be down the hall or in a different place altogether. It seems like extraordinary evidence. Yeah, so it's uh, it's like the evidence for psi processes in general. Are, are psi processes? Uh, uh, some people in the academy and science seem to seem to think that that's just all a hoax. Mm -hmm. But it seems that it actually is a lot of a lot of solid evidence. You make a claim that it, these are actually facts of nature. Yeah, I, I I personally think that no one can seriously study this literature with an open mind mm -hmm. and fail to come to the conclusion. That these phenomena do exist. What, what's what would you say is the most the most strongly verified instances of, of psychical or something? Well, I mean, there's the, the literature has two main dimensions. There's there's a, a large body of spontaneous cases, mm -hmm. for example, uh, crisis apparitions in which a person in location A uh, sees sees an image of uh, a loved one B uh, who's in a thought to be in a remote location, but who in fact is in the process of dying in that remote place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the apparition may even uh, show marks or wounds of the, of the sort that yes. did kill the person. And so a lot of these cases have been documented in, in detail. Uh, but then there's also a big experimental literature. There are thousands mm -hmm. of uh, experimental studies published in peer-reviewed journals that 
collectively establish the existence of the main phenomenon. Like the t telepathy yeah. or precognition and... Right. Yes. Um, you know, another theme in your, in, uh, in your book, uh, Beyond Physicalism and the, other, and the Irreducible Mind, which I hope we'll get a chance to talk about, is you say also that mysticism is also one of mm -hmm. the great witnesses to the kind of irreducibility of, of mind to brain. Yeah. Uh, this is a harder argument to make. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I have to say that um, my interest is relatively recent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let me go back a little further here. I, you know, I, I got involved in experimental psi research back in the 1970s mm -hmm. and had the great good fortune to meet a guy who was really a terrific psi subject, one of the best ever to come mm -hmm. into a lab. So I became convinced early on of the reality of the phenomena. But like most people, and I, I mean, I was a physicalist in graduate school, just kind of <laughs> imbibed it from the atmosphere. Yes, you know? Of course, it's hard not to yeah, universe. Really, it's yes. everywhere. Uh, but I continued to hope, I guess, that some minor adjustment mm -hmm. of our basic scheme of things mm -hmm. would allow for these phenomena. And I've been driven further and further from that expectation over years, and especially through the, the process of uh, developing irreducible mind. Mm -hmm. and well, what is really that, say, by the way? I yeah. Think, you know, and that's to interrupt your, your flow of thought, but that's a great metaphor, but what does it actually yeah. mean? Um, at the, in the CERSEM project, we, uh, we, after spending some time reviewing the evidence, we came to a kind of general plan about uh, what we wanted to do. We wanted to uh, basically launch an all-out attack on physicalism. Mm -hmm. And it would have two parts. The first would be to show empirically that physicalism cannot be correct because there are factually established uh, behavioral or mental capacities of human beings that cannot be explained in physicalist terms. Right. Uh, and that, was, that led to the book Irreducible Mind. Mm -hmm. And we touched upon not only psi phenomena in general, but uh, aspects of uh, for example, extreme psychophysiological influence, aspects of memory that have never been explained, uh, cases of um, secondary consciousness, secondary personality, often involving personal characteristics, mental capacities that greatly exceed those of the normal waking self, and these peculiar relationships of consciousness where the the secondary personality, B, knows all that's going on in A as well as its own doings, but not vice versa. So, uh, and how to explain that in neurophysiological terms is a real challenge. <laughs> in any terms, it would yeah. seem, but especially in those well, terms, yeah. yes. But the yoga traditions of India uh, seem to offer a, a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. and you have an article with the leading yoga scholar, Ian Witcher, mm -hmm. in, uh, I believe it's in Beyond Physicalism. In the second book, yeah. yes. Uh, let me uh, dispatch the first book uh, with uh, just a couple yes. more sentences. Yeah, and then we, uh, we had a big chapter on NDEs, including this point about... Uh, uh, ones that occur under conditions where uh, most neuroscientists uh, would feel certain no experience can occur, but their people are having not only experiences, but really powerful transformative experiences. And there's good evidence for that. Uh, then we have chapters on genius, especially its most extreme forms, like in the uh, Indian mathematician mm -hmm. Ramanujan. Mm -hmm. If that's the right pronunciation, I don't even know. Ramanujan, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and a final chapter on mystical perhaps. experience. Right. And uh, yeah, we go through the whole uh, constructivist versus uh, uh, perennialist yes, business. Yes, I theory. noticed that. That's an area, that's an area yeah. that I'm well versed in. You've well, really expertly done, I must say. Well, thank you. I'm yes. glad to know that. I mean, uh, I almost didn't need to write my own chapter when I read that. I realized that I should have just, I should have just gotten that chapter and put it into my book. <laughs> uh, we should have, yeah, it was uh, excellent. Thank you for that. You, yes. uh, you cover a whole lot more material. And I mean, it really is shocking to me that uh, Katz and his compatriots have had the kind of impact yeah, over 30 year studies. run and yeah. complete absolute rout of the whole field yeah. within a space of a year or so they went from stasian yeah. kind of perennialism to katzian constructivism and it's still pretty much the, mm -hmm. the regnant uh, ideology well it's uh, gonna have to be tempered as we definitely agree it's definitely and i was rooting for houston smith at that same <laughs> meeting that you were you there too no oh, but you no. my description yeah, of it, right. yes you would have been rooting yeah. for it always oh, a great moment yeah. yes
Um, what, what's the, so what is the, I think relevant to this, and, and what could bring a lot of it together is, is what you refer to as the Myers-James filter model. Yes, and this is really the, the kind of main consequence of mm -hmm. uh, irreducible mind. I, I think we collected under one roof, so to speak, uh, enough evidence to convince a lot of people that physicalism is wrong. Mm -hmm. And in addition, to show that an alternative way of thinking about the mind-brain correlation advanced by James, in particular at the end of the 19th century, is a viable idea of how the mind-brain yes. system works. And this is this permission or transmission or filter idea that mind and brain are really in some way uh, functionally distinct, mm -hmm. that mind operates in conjunction with the brain but is not generated by it. Mm. And if you accept that as a way of thinking about things, and I believe it can explain all the other facts we have about, uh, for example, uh, neuropsychology and so on, and in addition can potentially explain additional facts, possibly including things like psi phenomena and so on. Uh, and once you adopt that point of view, it, it clearly opens the door to survival. The big obstacle to survival is the objection that, well, minds are generated by physiological processes. Mm -hmm. No physiology, no mind, period. End of conversation. It, it, is there any, uh, any neurobiological, um, relevant neurobiological and neuroscientific evidence that could bolster the, the filter uh, model claim? Well, there must be a lot. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we assemble a lot of what there is in Irreducible Mind, but there's new stuff coming mm -hmm. out more oh, yes. recently. Yes. Uh, just to give one example that we talked about at some length in uh, Beyond Physicalism, mm -hmm. which we'll get to in a moment, uh, work on neuroimaging studies with psychedelics. Oh. Uh, for example, a group in England has done a fMRI study with psilocybin, mm -hmm. where they injected the psilocybin, so it's a very brief, intense experience that can be followed closely in time because of the better properties of fMRI. Uh, and to everyone's surprise, the intensity of the experience is directly related to the amount of deactivation and decoupling of major nodes of a thing called the default mode network, which mm -hmm. is the, the, the large system in the brain that customarily sort of anchors us to the here and now in our shared is that where the uh, where, where your mind wandering? That's that that's yeah. that's 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 it's, functioning. Yeah, it's, yeah, yes, yeah. all involved with that. Uh, so that can clearly mm -hmm. be understood in the context of a filter model. I mean, just like people having NDEs, they essentially don't have a brain. <laughs> and uh, these uh, people having intense psychedelic experience, theirs has been modified. So in the some brain way. basically it's not, way. it's not the D the DM it says the default the D, the default DMN. mode DM it's not functioning. Not functioning. So it means that they're not should, functioning in the normal way. So therefore, what should be the case if it's not? I mean, if apart from the psychedelics, what does that well, signify? Well, you know, the, the the clear message to us, which we pursue in Chapter Four of Beyond Physicalism, is let's look at ways of kind of tinkering with that system to see if we can figure out mm. how to open this filter uh, you know, in a more selective and kind of uh, gentle. Way perhaps uh, so have a so not so intense like injecting psilocybin. Yeah. How, well, how about you know contemplative practice like meditation well, or mindfulness? Yeah. These must do something with the default mode network as well. Yeah, I mean clearly people are having very intense experiences of a mystical sort. Right. In, right. in connection with advanced meditation, and we're anxious to study people who right. can do that sort of thing. Yes. So far, it's very unclear to me the the the, the neuroimaging literature on meditation is in a very confusing condition. Mm -hmm. yes. First of all, I should say that the, the great majority of the studies are uh, studies of beginning practitioners, you know, mm -hmm. carried out by people who often aren't very sympathetic to the subject to begin with. Ah, uh, yes. And uh, mainly looking at things like, uh, you know, control of heart rate or blood pressure or some other uh, physiological parameters. It's, it's the marriage of meditation research with public health through <laughs> It almost seems a little bit odd to have this a lot of this machinery, like, you know, you get an MRI and you're meditating inside. It mm -hmm. does seem like there's... But in a way, is that a hopeful sign? I mean, the clunky as all of that is, mm -hmm. it also... It could provide... Can it not do something for the study of spirituality that maybe we're not able to do on the humanity side these days? Absolutely. And uh, I think it's inevitable that as 
we get larger and larger cadres of persons seriously practicing meditation, that other things are going to come along with that, like psi phenomena and mystical experiences. Uh -huh. And furthermore, uh -huh. there, there is already a small but very interesting literature of studies involving advanced practitioners of one uh -huh. or another sort. And even though I at least can't make sense of it uh, in toto, I'm well aware that things go on that you simply do not see in ordinary persons under ordinary circumstances. Well, it, it uh, does. Uh, it seems like perhaps that, they're, that the coming together of meditation research and 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 psychic research that mm -hmm. hasn't actually happened. You're saying, and that that that's a promising area for the it's, future. For, it's begun, but it's yeah, begun. It's, we're, it's begun. We've scratched the surface, and so far, right. so good. Well, it's been really uh, great to be here to talk to you about these topics. Is there anything that I left out, or is there anything you'd like to add? Well, before yeah, we... let me just uh, yeah. add a bit about uh, yes. phase two. Phase two. Okay. Fa phase one of the project was the easy part, so to speak because it was mainly just a kind of a vast clerical job to hunt down all these mm -hmm. uh, relevant studies mm -hmm. scattered over an enormous biomedical literature. I can imagine, um, yes. Having done that, the, we go on to the, the hard task, which is to try and anticipate what's coming to replace physicalism. Some mm -hmm. kind of a scientifically grounded but more expansive scientific view of the world that can potentially accommodate all the phenomena we catalog in irreducible mind. Is that idealism? You point towards idealism. Uh, that's where it goes. I mean, I, uh, I, we don't have an absolutely unanimous point of view, but we're all sort of headed in that direction. You say we, you're talking about the Sersham Sersham group. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the alternative uh, to, to well, there, are there dualists? Or? Yeah, there are a couple of dualists and there are some uh, panpsychists of various persuasions. How about Sprig? Remember T, uh, TLS Sprig? I uh, wish I could have met that guy. I didn't, but I read his book, yeah. wonderful book. And is he, an, is he, a, he must be a, an influence or? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, in fact, I write uh, quite a bit about him in chapter 14 of Beyond Physical. I noticed yeah. Sprigs in there, and I, yeah. I, I became acquainted with some years ago. Uh, well, what do you think about the the older idealists like uh, F.H. Uh, like like Bradley? Well, uh, yes. you know, they're very much in the mix. And if, mm -hmm. for me, uh, I'm at a point where I no longer think there's any place to stop once one abandons mm -hmm. physicalism, mm -hmm. short of its essential, essentially exact opposite, which is some, some kind of idealism. And I'd add that there are several books coming out in within the next year or so, uh, written by people who have had uh, one or more mystical experiences, who are deeply versed in modern physics, and who are developing mm. their individual idealistic uh, schemes of nature. Uh, do you, can you say what they are? They, they're still under wraps? Or? Uh, Paul Marshall? Yes. Remember that name? Yes, I do. I do know that I know him okay. as a mysticism yeah. researcher. Right. Yes, certainly, yes. Uh, Federico Fagin, who's one of the pioneers of the microelectronics industry in the U.S., mm -hmm. an Italian physicist by training. Uh, and Bernardo Castrop, who's a computer engineer who worked at CERN uh, and is now, he's been generating well, papers and books all over the place. Certainly look forward to reading yeah. those books, yes. Good stuff. Well, great. Well, uh, Ed, Professor Kelly, it's been really great being here with you again to give us a sense of what important work you're doing here at DOPS at the University of Virginia. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks. Let me just add. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, yes. Uh, I personally think that we are really at the beginning of a very exciting time mm -hmm. in which science will, from its own internal logic of development, have to expand in a direction that's going to make it much more friendly to mm -hmm. uh, religious and spiritual ideas. All that. And that's a hopeful sign for humanity at large, I'd say. Well, I, and the fate of the planet. And the fate of, that's <laughs> essential. And, and if anyone reads uh, Professor Kelly's books, you, you will see that that vision of, of a new science comes through very clearly. Thank you, Professor Kelly. Mm -hmm. Thank you.